Happy New Year's guys, I'm back with a new video. Thought I would try something new this time, and rather than review a comic that I've never read before, I decided to read a comic that is one of my personal favorites. Mostly because I got this bad boy right here. This is 800 pages of Luke Skywalker action. And since Luke Skywalker's been my hero since birth, uh, it only makes sense that I have this book. It contains several different stories that have been reprinted here in one collected volume. Uh, most of them I have already, but there are a few, I guess, British ones from Marvel back in the day that I've actually never seen before. Something I'm really excited about with this book is it has Walkabout printed in full color. I had this comic as a kid. Uh, it showed up, I think, for the first time in Dark Horse Presents. Not sure which issue number. But it has a, uh, a yearbook photo, you know, uh, collection of photos on the cover. And it has Luke Skywalker as a young kid. Stories basically Luke and his friend, his childhood friend Wendy getting lost in the desert. And uh, I believe it's the first time anyone ever tackled the subject of Obi-Wan uh, looking after Luke Skywalker and rescuing him and then taking him back to the uh, to the farm. Spoiler alert, and Uncle Owen having an, uh, a big problem with Obi-Wan being around. So I'd recommend it if you guys were interested. But that is not why we are here today. If there's one thing that I could kind of claim that I know a lot about, it's not comics, it's Star Wars. So here's a brief backstory from my life. I was born in 1981. In two years, Return of the Jedi will come out. In another year or two, Star Wars will be gone for the next 15 years. I showed up, got super interested right at the end of it. For those doing the math, yes, I would have been two years old seeing Return of the Jedi for the first time in the drive-in. How do I have a memory of that experience? Because as soon as the Ewok showed up on screen, the film broke. So in some ways, I was present for Star Wars' original run, and I also missed it at the same time. And then one day, I'm sitting there with my dad watching TV in the living room, and he comes across QVC. And who do we see hawking Star Wars products but Mark Hamill? At some point, uh, I'm like, Dad, can we buy something, please? And he's like, sure, what do you want? And I chose these. Six comic books of a story I've never heard of with gold foil embossed logos and brand new artwork with certificate of authenticity. And these have become some of my most prized comic books. A new Star Wars story that I had no idea existed, which isn't surprising because we've established on this show in the past that I went to the comic shop every three to six months. So it's no wonder that I didn't know that these existed, especially without the advent of the internet for another three or four years. There were rumblings that Star Wars was on its way back with the uh, Timothy Zahn novel, Heir to the Empire. But uh, from what, I've, what I understand, the, this series and that series were being written almost at the exact same time. And at that point, the people in charge were trying to put together a coherent continuity because they had planned to do more stories in the universe. They even asked Timothy Zahn to incorporate parts of Dark Empire into the backstory of his story, Heir to the Empire, which he refused. Which is one thing that I really hate about uh, other authors doing Star Wars stuff, is, is their selfishness in, in thinking that they know what is right about the story. Yeah, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Especially with, like, backlash that happened with the New Jedi Order, but that's a totally different topic. So I'm just going to put this out there, and I know you guys are going to disagree with me, but I know you love Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, and Last Command, and prefer that as your 7, 8, and 9 chapters. But for me, Dark Empire is the end of that series. It is 7, 8, and 9. Uh, doesn't even necessarily need the sequels, because I think it stands on its own. It's the one for me that's the most in line with what they were planning in the uh, the planning stages of, of Return of the Jedi and where the story, not Return of the Jedi, Empire Strikes Back, and where the story was going to go. You know, Luke having a twin sister, but it wasn't Leia. It was some other character named Neleth being trained in either another galaxy or another part of the galaxy. And they were going to come together uh, in the last series. The Emperor wasn't even going to show up until the later movies, Darth Vader was going to be done in Jedi, and then the Emperor would show up, and then brother and sister would come together to defeat the Emperor finally, once and for all. For the purposes of this review, I will be using this version of the comic. If you can find it, I suggest you buy it. It contains the complete Dark Empire trilogy. There were two sequels after this one, even though the story is good enough to stand on its own. 
As a side note, I was uh, thinking about adding music to this review as, you know, so you'd have something to listen to as you hear me ramble. But then uh, that uh, Darth Vader Shards of the Past issue happened, and uh, yeah. So yeah, just listen to the sultry sounds of my voice. Dark Empire was written by Tom Veitch, Veitch? and the wonderful Cam Kennedy did the art. I love the artwork in this. The, uh, the other day I saw somebody, or I saw several people online on a Facebook post actually complaining about it, and all I could respond with was, how dare you? You start, of course, with the opening crawl. It's ten years after Return of the Jedi. Coruscant is in Heir to the Empire, and it's controlled by the New Republic, Luke and all his friends. But it was taken back uh, by factions of the Old Empire, who break out into a civil war on the planet. Luke Skywalker and Lando Calrissian, who are conducting a raid over the planet, are shot down, and Han, Leia, Chewbacca, and C-3PO go to find them. The space around Coruscant itself is a cluster of wreckage from the Imperials fighting each other. I like to picture the sky filled with flaming debris as ship chunks rain down into the atmosphere. That would be amazing to see. Uh, six pages in, and with this shot, I immediately feel like I was, or felt like I was enjoying Star Wars again. Uh, it felt like a new good movie. Good being the emphasis. Most of our classic heroes are together again and doing stuff again. Imagine that. Here's a shot of the Imperial Civil War. Two things here. Coruscant wasn't really established yet in Star Wars, um, from what I remember. Heir to the Empire had it, and Ralph McQuarrie had done concept paintings for Return of the Jedi, but I believe it wasn't until 1997 in the special editions that it was finally visually defined. So that's one reason why it might not look like the movies. Here, Leia mows down an at in the gunner seat of the Millennium Falcon, and we get some dialogue showing that she's been learning the Force and stuff since the last movie. The Heir to the Empire trilogy also pushes this with Leia actually using a lightsaber here and there, as uh, seen in these pictures. And they meet up with Lando and the Lost Rebels. Ewoks. I need Ewok Rebel Commandos in more of my life. I love this. It's a familiar alien design from a previous movie used in a new way. Something the latest movie seemed to be avoiding at all costs so far, which infuriates me. Instead, opting for inferior, ali ugly alien designs, but anyway. But there's a reunion of old friends, and Lando reveals that Luke disappeared into the ruins after this, or the ruins of the city after they came down. And uh, yeah, Luke Skywalker has vanished. That uh, that sounds familiar. It's probably nothing. It's a happy reunion for our heroes until suddenly scavengers show up and taking advantage of the skirmish, they unleash neck battle dogs as a distraction and they run off to, uh, you know, salvage parts off of the Millennium Falcon. Suddenly they're hurled away by a shadowy figure suspiciously looking like the silhouette of Darth Vader. It wasn't until just this minute doing this review that the uh, foreshadowing and subtlety of this really hit home for me. See, when they were coming up with the original idea for Dark Empire, they wanted to have a villain, villain that was wearing the Darth Vader armor. Lucas shot down the idea and suggested another character that we'll, we'll get to. But the art here is a really cool suggestion and works overall for the main story. We still don't know who this character is, but he uses the Force to destroy these battle droids. Still really looks like Darth Vader, and surprise, surprise, it's Luke Skywalker. And now he's staring down an Adat Walker on foot. We've seen Luke take down an Adat on foot before in Empire. Uh, using a tow cable and a grenade. Is he going to do that again? Weird. That looks familiar, too. It's probably nothing. Negative. Instead, he deflects the Adat shot back into its face and pushes the thing down with ease in one of the greatest, most memorable shots in all of Star Wars media. I would say that it fits one of three criteria I have for any good Star Wars movie or any good movie in general, and that is memorable set pieces. I'll get to that later, though. The at, at scene is an example of an intimidating force from a previous movie and showing a character's growth by attacking the same problem in a new way. We used to need tow cables and speeders or grenades. Now he's become a master and can stand his ground against greater odds. The writer also isn't afraid to use a powerful Luke Skywalker. 
And a powerful Luke Skywalker means that the odds against him are also going to have to be more powerful. That does not mean, however, that we need a new AT-AT Walker that is 15 times the size of the old one. Or a new, bigger super weapon. Any of that nonsense. What we need is something new. Weirdly at this point, all of our heroes from the previous movie are in the same scene now. And interacting with each other in which what I would call movie time would be within the first half hour. And the reader is happy to see them again for the first time since 19, 1983. We've overcome the neck battle dogs. We've overcome the battle droids. We've overcome the scavengers. We've overcome the at, -at walker. And we have a short reunion with friends. But the reunion is sh short-lived as a force storm, something new we've never seen before, comes out of hyperspace and starts breaking across the city of the er, surface of the city planet. City planet. If they haven't evacuated or gone down to the lower levels of Coruscant, so many people are dying right now. Jedi Master Luke Skywalker knows the storm is there for him and tells the others to leave. Only brave, loyal R2-D2 stays behind with his master as they're sucked up into the storm. As Han and Leia and the others leave Luke and R2 behind, they return to Pinnacle Base, where the Rebels are receiving images of the Empire's newest and deadliest weapons, the World Devastators. Images from Mon Calamari, Admiral Akbar's home planet, are, are being sent to Pinnacle Base, showing the World, Devasta World Devastators wreaking havoc. They're uh, giant flying furnaces that suck up raw material and produce ships and vehicles for war while sweeping across the battlefield. Ah! Just imagine sucking up your enemies and their ships to process them in your furnaces and to create further instruments of destruction. Elsewhere, Lord, I love this page. Luke and R2 find themselves in a Mandalorian dungeon ship meant to hold Jedi prisoners during the Clone Wars. Back when the Mandalorians were the Jedi's enemies during the Clone Wars, hence all the flamethrowers and knee darts. Back before all the source material was changed for George's less than stellar prequels. Did you know that Obi-Wan and Uncle Owen were brothers? Lucas may have had notes for what the prequels could be, but I don't believe he consulted them very often when writing, but I digress. Luke and R2 are yanked out into a cage and let, led through the city on a, on a planet called Bis, which is the new Imperial, I don't know, focus point. Good lord, I can't tell you how much I love the Imperial Sentinels. I need an action figure of them that's to actual scale. These designs are pretty great too. Cam Kennedy is the best, and I, I, I don't I don't get how people can't love his his design choices. Uh, the whole comic overall, the the coloring and everything, just makes me feel nostalgic for that late '80s type of art style. And uh, I don't know, I can't really explain it. But anyway, Luke is being awesome again. And finally, we come to discover who's behind the Force Storm and who will unify the Imperial factions once more. A familiar cloaked figure, the Emperor. Luke will come to find out that the Emperor has been able to clone himself and transfer his essence, and that he exists more as dark side energy now than anything. The dark side is also responsible for the deterioration of his body. There's a short story in uh, Star Wars Visionaries, uh, where Palpatine goes through this grim dark side ritual to rejuvenate his body like some kind of reptile shedding its old self. I really like that comic for trying to come up with a link for why Palpatine would look more like a monster uh, from when he gets hit with the Force Lightning, you know, in that scene with Mace Windu. Uh, it, like, rapidly aged his already weakened vis visage, visage. Uh, I like to think of that as canon if I have to consider the prequels as part of canon. Yes, the cloned Emperor was a suggestion of George Lucas. I have to wonder if Lucas's treatment for 7, 8, and 9 uh, when he sold them included some kind of similar idea. And if so, a Dark Empire gets a negative rap, if that's why we have Snoke. Uh, a way of being different but the same, as Poorly, very poorly executed, as that turned out to be. This moment is controversial. Luke is at a dead end. He's renounced the dark side and the Emperor. He threw away his lightsaber and risked death. Well, risked death. 
To force his father to act, and Vader threw the Emperor down a reactor shaft to his death. What a mind F it would be to see the same exact man sitting there looking no different from 10 years ago, and picking up exactly where you left off. Luke figures there's nothing else he can do but to join the Emperor and try to find some other means of conquering the dark side, once and for all, from within. This decision is will also introduce a backstory to the Star Wars universe, and make Star Wars feel a little bit bigger, and also figures into my three criteria for movies thing. To be honest, as a kid, this decision for him to turn actually broke my heart a little bit. Um, but if you pause and reflect on what's actually happening, and why he makes this decision, it makes sense. Comic books are primarily guilty, I'd say, of having been having to be edited versions of the whole story. I know for certain that the uh, Heir to the Empire comics and Shadows of the Empire both left certain scenes out for time, and I'm so sure so that they didn't end up killing their artists. Plus, they usually have to fit a story within like six issues, and something's gotta go at that point. Leia senses Luke is in trouble and tells Han that they need to save him, and as is Han's role, and has always been his role, uh, he's going to help bail Luke out. This is pinnacle base, by the way. I like this shot a lot, and it used, to, it used to appear on the back of one of my favorite Star Wars Galaxy trading cards, number 162. Frequently use it as my bookmark, and have for years and years. Uh, this is also one of my favorite pictures of Luke Skywalker, by the way. Meanwhile, on Mon, Mon Calamari, Lando and Wedge Antilles are taking the other Star Destroyer from Endor to help, uh, you know, fight the world devastators. They bring with them new ship designs like the V-Wing and the E-Wing, while the Devastators start pumping out droid-controlled TIE Fighters. Uh, I, I imagine that there, there had to have been some like crossover there for inspiration for the, the Clone Wars later on. One of the coolest things for me coming from this whole series was it was included as a freaking level in Rogue Squadron on the N64 and PC. You could play out this battle, and that was awesome. Leia receives a vision of Darth Vader that transforms into Luke, who warns her not to come after him. He explains that he's learning things their father knew, but this hardens Leia's resolve to bring Luke back. To do that, they'll need passage into the core systems where Biss is located, and they head to Han's old home turf of Narshada. This is a dangerous prospect, as the Huts have put a huge bounty on the people responsible for killing Jabba, specifically Leia. And as they arrive in system, we're introduced to one of Han's old friends, Mako, Mako Spence, who suggests that they go see his other buddy, Shug Ninx, to try and get passage. Though evidently, the Millennium Falcon has been recognized and they're pursued by this strange triangular-looking ship all the way to Shug's garage. Uh, they're deterred by Shug's security systems, and our heroes make it in. What the heck? Why is Slave 1 there? And what happened to it? Inside the garage, we're introduced to Salazen and Shug Nix. Nix? Nix. Uh, Salazen is actually Han's old flame. Uh, this is the... This comic is the first appearance of all three of these characters, Mako, Shug, and Sala. They would later show up in the true Han Solo backstory, the Han Solo trilogy, by A.C. Crispin. And, uh... That's how I spent last May, rather than going to see that movie, which also interconnects with the Brian Daly backstories, which also interconnects with the adventures of the Lando, of Lando Calrissian books. So, only a brainless, uninformed idiot would think that the expanded universe didn't follow a narrative structure. Whatever the hell that means. Speaking of brainless, Hyperspace Compass. Before that eighth movie, there was a game where Luke Skywalker was looking for a hyperspace compass. This is the dumbest thing ever. Look at Han's face. This is obviously a scam perpetuated on him by an unsavory character in the seedy parts of Narshana, and he recognizes it. It works in the context of the scene. Why would you need a hyperspace compass if you have a Nava computer? I see from a quick glance at Wikipedia that even the EU had them in some small measure as backup if the Nava computer failed, but it still strikes me as having to be another computer in that case. But I think even those writers missed the point of it showing up in this bit. I can't tell you how much it irritates me that they ran with this dumb idea in the new stuff. It's, it's basically Jack Sparrow's compass forced into Star Wars, just like that heinous scene in Rogue One where all the dumb idiot rebels 
complain in a big meeting about not fighting, just like all the dumb idiot pirates in At World's End complain about not fighting. Anyway, moving on. Han and Leia run into Vima de Boda. Vima de Boda. Just making sure I said it right. Previously a Jedi that escaped the Jedi Purge and the ancestor of Nomi Sunrider from Tales of the, Je the Tales of the Jedi series. She gives Leia a mysterious box before vanishing in the non-Jedi sense. They head to Han's old apartment looking for fancy power couplings in exchange, quote unquote, fancy power couplings in exchange for transport to the core worlds. And they're greeted by Han's old droid, ZZ4Z. ZZ for short. But surprise, mofos, Boba Fett's back from the dead with his best friend Johnny Cash. I mean, Dengar. Turns out Mako Spin sold Han and Leia out, and now they're fleeing for their lives. An un uh, a quote unquote innocent hut is caught in the crossfire and falls from his hover sled, which Han and Leia steal. And that is definitely not going to help the price that's already on their heads for killing Jabba. They fly up to Shug and Sala's Starlight Intruder, bound for the Core Worlds, and already underway. Approaching the planet Biss, uh, Boba Fett and Dengar are in hot pursuit, but can't th make it through the planetary shield in time, and the Millennium Falcon avoids them just in time. Is this the end for Boba Fett and his sidekick Johnny Cash? They provide clearance for them to land in the Citadel or what have you, but Han Solo is not one to not have a backup plan, so he brings Sala and Shug along to blast the Falcon out of there. Who's currently flying the Starlight Intruder is anyone's guess. Luke uses another dark side trick and brings his friends to a cloning chamber, and shockingly, Luke is missing his prosthetic hand. He explains that they're replacing it with a better one, because why on earth would you not? It's not like he's going to let his hand just rot away to the mechanical monstrosity underneath. That would be unbearably stupid. In all seriousness though, seriousness though, when I was younger, the idea of Luke having a gloved hand from Return of the Jedi was so ingrained in me that I was mildly confused that he would get it fixed. But I was young and dumb, and that's my excuse. An Imperial Sentinel grabs Han and Leia loses her cool. Using the lightsaber she found in the box from Vima de Boda, she threatens the Emperor. It's cool to see Leia grow and do new slash realistic character things since Return of the Jedi that don't involve the vacuum of space. Side note, I love this picture of the Emperor. It's very well rendered. But he hits her with lightning and we get a moment that makes us further question what is happening with Luke as he chokes Han. Later, Sala and Shug are, Shug? are hiding out with the Falcon and a friend's uh, ship when a freaking enormous probe droid finds and chases them out of there. This is the introduction of the Jedi Holocron, and since the Clone Wars series, I feel like they've really lost their air of mystery. For those that don't know, they're supposed to be repositories of Jedi knowledge. Jedi Masters imprint their thought pat patterns onto them to interact with future students and help guide them as much as they can. But then they did this episode where Cad Bane steals a holocron because the crystals inside have the list of future Jedi younglings, and it was terrible. They had all the source material. Uh, I believe there were even West End games uh, that did books on them, not to mention the essays at the end of each of these comics, which I'll mention later. And that was the best they could come up for, or come up with, for the uh, why the villains were stealing the holocrons. The Clone Wars show itself had some decent episodes, but it took them four seasons to get there. And watching the behind-the-scenes stuff where they said that uh, they would just bring George a stack of material that ha uh, had everything for a particular subject, like the Mandalorians. And he would say, I like this and this and this, and the rest they would just shove aside. That is effing heartbreaking. I don't care what your argument is. The Holocron is an, uh, was another element that added them to the mystery of the Force and the Jedi. They were as exciting and interesting as the lightsabers themselves, and, you know, they, they were rare, so it made them special. I hate how mundane both of those devices have become since the prequels. But anyway, the Emperor shows Leia the holocron of Jedi Master Bodo Boss and tells her how he's going to possess the body of her child that is currently within Leia's womb. Oh yes! I forgot to mention that Jason and Jaina Solo have already been born in Heir to the Empire, and Anakin Solo is now on his way. Leia is having none of this, as Leia is prone to do, and flip flips the Super Centenarian off his hover sled, being in his weakened condition and needing to transfer to a new body soon. 
Also, she's made off with the holocron, which probably ticks off the Emperor more than he already was falling and landing on his bad hip. I'm assuming he has a bad hip. Luke's new hand is coming along nicely when Leia finds him, stuffing R2 to the gills with Imperial information for killing the World Devastators, and 3PO is freaking out as 3PO does. He convinces Leia that he's finally ready to go, but she's still e uneasy about it. But really, how could she not trust those yellow-green eyes? In a humorous shot, we cut to Han and Chewie trying to break out of prison, when one of those giant probe droids shows up, controlled by Shug, and blasts a hole in the wall. Luke and Leia then show up, and Han is having none of Luke's nonsense anymore. Leia has to interject, and they all escape on the Falcon as more probe droids show up and start blasting the heck out of each other. Our heroes are safe and on their way back home when Luke reveals he's actually a projection and has remained on Bis to finish off the Emperor and all of his clones. Boy howdy, that sounds familiar. It's probably nothing. As he destroys the cloning tanks though, he's too late and a naked, reborn Emperor rises from the shattered remains to defeat Luke in combat. Back on Mon Calamari, the Devastators have stopped in their tracks, thanks to Luke and R2's efforts, and the Rebel Commandos move in for the kill. This is another example of an awesome set piece. As a kid, any scene that involved heroes dangling over an abyss while fighting was the best thing ever. And here you have Rebels scaling ropes and rocketing up on jetpacks, and getting into firefights with stormtroopers over, over 100 or more foot falls to, the, to their dooms. It's wonderful. I love this picture so much. Here, R2 rigs a code to make the world devastators attack each other, and the day is finally won. Leia consults the Holocron once again and learns of a, uh, a prophecy about two walkers of the sky. And since you need the Force to interact with the Holocron, it's not really surprising that it's specifically tailored to her. The biggest ship to date, the Eclipse, appropriately named shows up over Pinnacle Base, and the Emperor demands the return of Leia and his holocron. With the knowledge from the holocron, Leia goes on her own to confront the Emperor and Luke, primarily to bring Luke back in a move that kind of mirrors the end of Return of the Jedi. Here, Luke moves to protect his sister and chops off the hand of the Emperor, which I like to think is a nice little F you to the Emperor for using Luke's hand in Heir to the Empire to create the evil clone Luke. In a rage, the Emperor creates a for another Force Storm, but brother and sister united with a third in the force to turn the Emperor's power against him. A fiery explosion, a narrow escape, and our heroes have won. From a distance, they watch as the Emperor's ship is destroyed, and in a show of optimism, Luke Skywalker declares the Jedi Knights will rise again. It might have taken him ten years to get to this point, but at least it wasn't freaking forty. Dark Empire gets a lot of flack, but I think most of that can be chalked up to one parent, one person saying they hate something, and then everyone else parroting that, uh, rather than investigating it themselves. The editing definitely works against the story. Those battle scenes would have ha would have been amazing to see on a big screen with the uh, rebel troopers being shot and falling over the sides of the devastators and stuff, perhaps falling from the back only to be sucked up into the furnaces. Um, for some reason, people hear cloned Emperor, and they take that as a negative. I see it as reinforcement of the warning to Luke that Yoda gave him, saying not to underestimate the powers of the Emperor. I like that the Emperor is more defined in this. Uh, you know, they further defined his power, and that we see he's capable of way more than just Force Lightning. Dark Empire is wonderful. Hey look, a quote that supports me. One of the best things in these comics for a kid that had had zero Star Wars content for the past 15 years were the end notes. Uh, they were miniature essays written by Tom Veach. Veach? I still don't know how to say that. Exploring the backstories for, his char for the characters and places, uh, they dealt with the ideas of Jedi being so powerful, such as Yoda, that they could manipulate the fabric of space and time. They explored where Luke Skywalker had been and where he was going, and they laid the groundwork for future stories in the expanded universe. Most of these endnotes were collected and turned into the Dark Empire Handbook, which uh, changed some things, and admittedly I still haven't gotten around to reading that. But back in 1992, these essays blew my mind. To come back to it real quick though, throughout this video you've heard me mention three criteria for a good Star Wars movie, but uh, here they are all are together. Um, 
Last year I sat down and watched the original Star Wars movies, non-special edition, and I noticed three things. One, they all have memorable set pieces, scenes as a kid, like, scenes that as a kid, you would want to act out. And they just so happen to be easy to turn into iconic playsets for toys. The trash compactor, the rancor pit, the sail barge, the gantry on Cloud City where Luke loses his hand, the carbon freezing chamber. I'm 37 and I still want playsets of all of these. They are iconic and just as memorable as the characters themselves. Two, there's always a random monster attack. It's a holdover from Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon comics and the 40s adventure serials. I've read a fair number of the originals and trust me when I tell you Star Wars is Flash Gordon. The Dianaga, the Wampa, the Rancor, the Sarlacc, the Sand People. The prequels had the uh, arena in Attack of the Clones, but I feel like overall they skimped a lot on uh, on monster attacks in the in the prequels, and I think it's part of a contributing reason for why I I personally am not a huge fan of those movies. If Dark Empire suffers from anything, it's a lack of random monster attack. They do kind of make up for it though a little bit in Dark Empire too. And last is introduce a little bit of something that makes the universe feel bigger with each story. In the first Star Wars, everything is new. In the second, they introduce the concept of bounty hunters, and the audience is like, who are these guys? In the third one, they hit you with the criminal underworld, and the design of Jabba is just shocking. Dark Empire would go on to inspire the great series Tales of the Jedi, set 4,000 years before the films, which would inspire the hugely popular game Knights of the Old Republic, which would inspire the fantastic Knights of the Old Republic comic series. Heir to the Empire and Dark Empire would go on to inspire the expanded universe for over 25 years, created and crafted by a group of people that loved the movies, and who would make it their mission to keep continuity as as tightly knit as they possibly could. All of that would end up culminating in a series that's one of my ultimate favorites, The New Jedi Order. Uh, it's, it's what the sequel trilogy should have learned from. It introduces new characters, a new, and a new threat, a new uh, war for the galaxy, an outside invader. Uh, it gives the Jedi a new challenge and really reinforces that concept of the Jedi Knights being the protect or guardians of peace and justice from all threats. And all of that would culminate in what I consider, you know, the end of Star Wars. It's it's basically the Ragnarok of Star Wars, and for me, where the entire universe ends. I mean, honestly, Return of the Jedi is the end of Star Wars, but if you have to keep it going, this is this is the finisher. And the heroes are free to go live happily ever after after that. You know, let them retire. Look, Star Wars is a dirt simple story with very specific, easily identifiable characters. Keep the story basic and introduce a little something new, like the holocrons, and you got a hit and you continue to make Star Wars feel bigger than it is. Whew, this is a long review. I have no intention for this channel to be all that controversial. Uh, I see enough of it on my own every day, and this place is meant to have fun and celebrate pa the past. But I do have very strong opinions about Star Wars, as does the rest of the world, I'm sure, and I appreciate you hearing me out. What can I learn and incorporate? <sighs> Honestly, Star Wars and Star Trek has always been a big influence. In 1995, on a walk, uh, I thought to myself, I'd like to make my own sci-fi universe. And that's basically been my driving motivation throughout life. Because of the EU and its stories, it's been a dream of mine to expand my universe in a similar way. I would love the opportunity to, do, to have uh, branches like Lucasfilm did. Uh, I would love to have a movie division that did the biggest, best action-adventure, stop-motion movies the, the world's ever seen, which also has comics that uh, spin off to expand the universe with separate side stories, which also turns into comic series, or not comic series, but cartoon shows that would also expand the universe a bit more. 
the EU is my dream, and I wish, I wish I could have one my own, uh, someday based on my own stuff. So yeah, I will always defend the uh, expanded universe. There are one or one or two novels here and there that I personally don't like, but overall it was pretty well maintained uh, up until George came along and started doing his prequels. As for what I've learned and I can take away from my own stuff, do amazing, interesting alien and ship designs, and try not to hold back. Just go nuts. Guys, that is it for this week. I hope you love Dark Empire as much as I do. Uh, I will be back next week with a new random comic issue. I'm going to do Savage Sword of Conan number 59. I had it as a kid. I hope you enjoyed this review. I will defend Dark Empire to the death. I love it. Go read it. Go read the sequels. And I will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.